Welcome to another special edition of Kibbe on Liberty, COVID edition. We've been talking so much about, about government mistakes and economic shutdowns and, and competing epidemiological studies, and, and I cannot say that word to save my life. I thought we'd do something different and look at, at a potential opportunity that has, that has been manifested by the, the shutdown of, of public schools. And for that, I have a guest on that I've wanted to have on, I think since last summer when we met at Porkfest, uh, Carrie McDonald. Hey, hon. It's going well, Matt. Thanks for having me. And you are, you have been writing on homeschooling and unschooling and education reform for quite some time. You're a scholar both at uh, the Foundation for Economic Education, one of my favorite go-to spots, and also the Cato Institute. Why don't you tell people a little bit about your background and, and how you got to be the person that knows so much about this stuff? Right. Yeah, so I'm a senior education fellow at FEE and an adjunct scholar at Cato and a frequent Forbes writer on experimental K-12 learning models. And then I wrote the book Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom that came out last May and has renewed interest this spring as a bit or more than a billion uh, uh, students around the world now are outside of their classrooms learning for the most part at home as we all are isolated from our larger community. So uh, my interest in uh, education really goes back to I was an economics major as an undergraduate but became interested in in education from the lens of a lack of choice and looking at kind of monopoly government schooling and realizing that that really limited innovation and uh, freedom for a lot of families. And so then I went to graduate school in education policy at Harvard, became more interested in education choice and really have spent about the last 20 years focused on uh, looking at education research and specifically alternative education and alternatives to school, um, looking at moving from force to freedom in education and really expanding options for more families. So the, the education system that everybody knows and that I grew up with, I went to public school and I, I, everyone I know did as well. Um, this is a model that goes back to kind of ancient times um, it, it, it almost seems like a factory where we're producing widgets. Is that still the right model? Well, it's interesting because I almost feel that there's a graph that move, that looks at education um, in terms of freedom to then force and now hopefully back toward education freedom. If we look just in colonial and revolutionary America, um, in the 1640s, so soon after the Pilgrims arrived in what would become Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, the colonists passed the first compulsory education law, which indicated a state interest in educated citizenry and compelled cities and towns of a certain size to uh, hire or open and operate a grammar school. So it was the cities and towns that were compelled by the state to provide education resources, not the parents to send their children to those learning places. And in fact, there was a wide variety of education choice. If we think about the colonial and revolutionary period, of course, homeschooling was the default. The expectation was that the parents were in charge of their child's education, but they were not always the ones teaching them. So there were dame schools, which were like little nursery schools in your neighbor's kitchen that would teach young children the three R's and let their parents get things done around the house. There were tutors that would come and, and offer guidance and support and learning. There was a public and private school schools, church schools, charity schools, and of course, apprenticeship programs uh, where you'd have kind of hands-on learning to learn a specific skill or trades. So quite a bit of education choice and variety uh, throughout the American colonial and revolutionary period. And that all changed in the mid-19th century with the passage again in Massachusetts now of the first compulsory schooling, compulsory attendance law that was passed in 18. 52, that for the first time compelled parents to send their children to school, what was a, considered a common school, under a legal threat of force. Uh, and of course, those compulsory attendance laws were expanded to all states uh, in the coming half century or a little bit more. 
And now I feel like the the uh, we're moving a little bit back toward parents demanding more options beyond a mandatory uh, assigned district school. It almost seems like uh, so, so much else in life, there's this clash between the natural tendency of, of government schools and the, I call it the education industrial complex, but the, but the really smart guys that wanted to impose common core and, and really centralize everything and make everything the same versus the, the sort of natural liberta liberating tendencies of, of technology and the various circumstances we all find ourselves in our lives. And, and that, that clash has, has really sort of exploded in every parent's living room now as, as they're trying to figure out how to use um, these top-down curriculums, or maybe they've scrapped them uh, right now because it doesn't actually make any sense. I think that's right. So if we think about, again, the, the onset of the common schools, those mandatory public schools in the mid-19th century, it's very true that they were focused on this sort of factory model of schooling. It was adopted from the Prussian model that focused on order and compliance and obedience and conformity, um, really uh, having a, a trained and obedient compliant workforce. And that was the norm throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century. And I think that now, yes, you're right, that families can get a glimpse uh, not only really a closer look in some ways of what their kids are doing in school, but also for the first time, I think, have a uh, I have a real opportunity to see the robust education options and resources outside of schooling that I think can move us from this kind of industrial model of mass compulsory schooling to um, something that's for the innovation era, where you know we should be relying on technology resources. We should be thinking about uh, not kind of robotic humans, but uh, really cultivate those essential human qualities that separate humans from robots. And those are the things like creativity and curiosity and innocence and entrepreneurial spirit that are so often crushed with this factory model of, of standard schooling. And that I think we can try to um, acknowledge that, you know, options now with all of these learning resources that are available. You know, you know, I, I smiled. One of the uh, articles that you linked to, uh, you've you've been publishing like a lunatic over the last month or so, and 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 I recommend that everybody read all of the stuff that you've posted on Cato and at Fee. But you linked to the uh, former education secretary from from Tennessee, I believe, that was very worried that this uh, this break from from top down factory schooling was going to set an entire generation of kids back. And he made an argument that I had never heard before. I'm sure you you know this argument well, but he, but he basically argued that um, every time uh, kids take a break from public schooling and go home for the summer, they lose all of the learning that, that they got during the school year, which made me ask the question, like, if, if it was learning, it wouldn't have just evaporated overnight. So you, you wonder if they're not giving a critique of their own system. I think that's right. Yeah, you're, you're hearing right now a lot of this alarmist narrative of what an education crisis we're in with young people, in many cases, not uh, completing school assignments, that any materials being sent home in a lot of large districts are considered optional or for enrichment purposes only. And I think the education establishment is really threatened by that, is really concerned. And so, yeah, you, you hear now a lot of this coronavirus learning loss, which is similar to what you mentioned is, uh, is this alleged summer slide or summer learning loss that purportedly occurs when young people are not in school during the summer. And I wrote an article a couple of years ago for NPR basically saying summer slide doesn't exist because of this exact point that if, um, if a, t a break from schooling means that all of that supposed learning is so easily lost, did they ever really learn at all? Or were they just well-schooled, that is, trained and tested on certain material or content that they were uh, that they were provided, but they didn't actually learn it? And also, what does that say for those of us who are adults or for recent high school graduates 
do they just so easily lose that content? Uh, and I think it is an indictment against this kind of tra training and testing standardization that we see increasingly uh, in, in American public schools. So two words that you're using, I think, are really important to kind of differentiate um, two very different paradigms. One is schooling, and that's the regimentation and one size fits all. We're going to treat every child the same, and we're going to sort of grind them through this process. I think of the old uh, Pink Floyd, another brick in the wall video, which very graphically uh, shows uh, young people just being beaten into conformity and, and perhaps just sort of crushing their creativity in that process versus actual learning. And, and learning is something that is unique to every child. There's not just one way to do it. And that that's really your expertise, both as a scholar and a practitioner. Um, you're, you're one of the, the go-to voices on unschooling and, and homeschooling and various, like there's there's just a number of different ways to, to, to help and mentor your your children going through this process. Describe a little bit about unschooling for people that have never heard the phrase. Right, so I like to use this broad definition of unschooling as really just disentangling education from schooling and looking at schooling as one method of being educated, um, but certainly not the only method and perhaps, again, not the best method for the innovation era and the realities that we currently face. Uh, so that's primarily when I talk about unschooling is really the separation from education and schooling. And fortunately, families are getting a bit of a glimpse of what that might look like, of course, under very difficult situations, um, you know, lots of stress and anxiety in our homes. But nonetheless, this uh, this opportunity to really see how we could be educated and, in fact, how children could be highly educated outside of a standard classroom. The, the term unschooling was coined in 1977 by uh, author and teacher John Holt, who became really the one of the pioneers of the modern homeschooling movement. And his definition of unschooling at the time was taking children out of school. Of course, this was a time when in many states homeschooling was illegal, illegal or in cases where it wasn't explicitly illegal, uh, it was fuzzy in terms of what was the parent's right to take a child out of school. And so really over uh, a period of about 20 years, there were a lot of legal battles and uh, a lot of you know bullying of families and threats toward families who did decide to take their children out of school. The term unschooling, I think, has evolved over the past few decades to really now mean um, more about self-directed education. So uh, really separating what we would think of as homeschooling in a traditional sense of simply replicating school at home with a packaged curriculum and a parent, um, you know, sort of directing daily activities so that the only thing that's really changed is the location of the education. It really is still schooling. And unschooling takes that a step further and says, you know, allow a young person's interests to guide their learning, allow that natural curiosity that all young children um, exude. I mean, you look at young children, they are, they are voracious learners. They're always questioning. They're incredibly curious. Uh, it might be difficult now for, for families with very young children because they're trying to get their work done and their young children are always asking questions and eager to learn. Um, but that curiosity and creativity that young children have doesn't just sort of magically disappear when they hit school age. Um, the professor Peter Gray at Boston College is a psychologist who writes the foreword to my unschooled book. He says that that um, that we are coercive system of schooling is what crushes that creativity, that curiosity, and those natural drives for learning. And so I think what we maybe get a chance to see now outside of schooling uh, are ways to rekindle that curiosity in children, to encourage them to pursue their interests using the vast digital resources, many of which are free right now, uh, to explore some new content, new ideas, and new experiences. You know, it's funny. I I remember uh, an, an episode that that I had forgotten from from my schooling uh, when I was a kid, and I must have been in like fifth or sixth grade. And I was really into history and economics. We called it social studies, as I recall. Yeah. 
And, and I kept going up to my teacher and saying, uh, what else can I do? What else can I do? I was writing papers and I was doing all these research projects and I was just really excited about it. And I'm sure that I was annoying as hell during this process. And, and she eventually said to me, you're doing too much. You need to stop. And that to me, um, when I was rewrite, when I was working on a, a new script that, that we're about to release a, a video about, about the education system, it's, it sort of captures everything that a one size fits all schooling system would do to a child's natural curiosity. And I, I was, I didn't know it at the time and I, I didn't perhaps even realize as when I was older in life, but I was sorting out the things that I was good at, the things that I was passionate about, the things that sort of sparked my creativity and the system shut me down. Right, and fortunately, you were able to revisit that passion in adulthood. But I often think about all of those curiosities that are crushed in younger children that don't get a chance to reemerge, that um, you know are lost. And I think that's a real tragedy. Uh, and if you think about just your passion as a fifth grader in economics and social studies and history, how much learning would occur through that? You know, you were I, likely devouring books and, like you said, wanting to write papers or explore these topics. When we allow young people to really pursue those interests, that takes place. And it's important to note that when I talk about unschooling or self-directed learning, uh, there's a really important role for adults in that. that this isn't just a free-for-all with kids going off and teaching themselves. They play a really critical role in encouraging their interests and, and specifically in connecting resources uh, to children. So acknowledging your interest in history and economics and then the adult um, match you with some potential resources to help you to, to um, expand that interest. And again, right now with all of these digital resources, it's never been a better time to help facilitate our children's self-directed learning. Uh, let me push back. You, you, uh, you are a homeschooler. I don't, I don't know how you describe yourself, but you have four children and you, you are teaching them yourself. Is that correct? My children uh, have never been to school. They're all unschooled. And yeah, I feel like, you know, my husband and I definitely, um, but we're not the ones, uh, you know, that are always teaching them. Not only do we use all of these wonderful resources, like I've been talking a lot about Khan Academy, which is probably the leader in free online learning videos for young people. Many schools also use this content. There's increased um, resources being offered by Khan Academy during this pandemic to help families to facilitate learning. So there's those kinds of digital resources, but I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and there are a, a, an abundance of resources for families. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think homeschoolers have been hearing a lot, and, you know, homeschoolers will tell you this is nothing like typical homeschooling, right? We spend more of our time outside of our homes than inside of our homes in typical homeschooling, really immersed in those people, places, and things of our community. Um, my kids take various classes throughout the city and attend a self-directed learning center a couple of days a week um, and really you know, pursue their interests. And so that isn't happening for us in very much the same way that it's not happening for other families as well. So I hope families are turned off by what they think is homeschooling. It is absolutely not being isolated in your home uh, all day with your children not being able to go anywhere. But I think this pandemic does pre present an opportunity to really tap into uh, not only your children's interests and encourage those interests using these online resources and all of this unstructured time that they uh, have the potential to, to really use well, um, but also to see, you know, what kind of learning comes from that. And in fact, uh, I recently spoke with a neighbor who is so surprised that her 10 year old who was in public school is just blossoming right now. You know, she kind of flies through the any work that's sent home from uh, the public school and is done with that in an hour or two and then has all of this time to read books and write short stories and do all the things that she's really interested in. And the, par the parents are, in fact, thinking that they may do learning without schooling even after the pandemic.
Yeah, I'm hearing a lot from uh, parents, uh, both on the Free the People team and just just friends and people on Facebook, and and there's a lot of different experiences. And this this whole challenge has been dropped on the shoulders of parents who are dealing with all sorts of other stuff right now. And I, I think it is important to point out that 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 homeschooling is not being locked into a room with your children while you're trying to do your job remotely and you're trying to do all these things. And, and for a lot of them, they're complaining about this, this curriculum that's kind of being imposed on them. They, a lot of uh, schools want you to recreate the same experience that they were having in the classroom. And you, you sort of advise against that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that right now is a stressful time for parents and children alike, that for parents, there's um, not only a shift in routine and now having to work from home or potentially um, have been laid off from work or not sure what work they'll be able to return. This is over. So parents are feeling a lot of anxiety and, and stress around this. And then children are picking up on that stress, but also they're disrupted. Their routines uh, and schedules have been shifted. And well. so I, I feel like if parents um, have the sense that they need to replicate home, either because that is what they think that they should be doing as parents, or because it's what the school is telling them to do, it can tensions rise and frustrations mount in what is already a really difficult situation for everybody. So to the extent that parents can disconnect from schooling, and in many places this is happening by default because either work is being sent home that's considered optional, or in some cases compulsory attendance laws are being loosened. We see the federal government offering waivers for all mandatory testing at the state level for this year. So there are these opportunities to disconnect. And to the extent parents can do that, I think uh, they will see that there are so much learning that can happen organically and emergently um, just by being with their children and doing some slow days and slower pieces. And then, you know, again, tap into many of these resources, right? And, and link to in many of the recent articles. Um, these just incredible resources, you know, virtual tours of 2,500 museums across the world or, you know, live streamed concerts every day that uh, listen to, uh, famous authors and artists, uh, live through how to do characters or reading their stories to children. So there's just really an abundance of great resources. And I think if parents can step away from that schooled mindset and allow real learn learning to occur, it will make this difficult situation much less stressful and more rewarding for everyone. Sort of an instinctual opportunity as, and, and you point this out in an article that, that I'll talk about in a second, but there's sort of an instinctual opportunity to um, explain to your curious children what's going on and why are certain things happening. Um, you, you wrote a cool little piece about the uh, uh, subjective value of toilet paper for fee and why people would hoard toilet paper during times of economic uncertainty and, and why it disappears from the shelves. Um, tell that story and, and just uh, as, a, as a sort of a way to, to show parents what, what they can do with the, with the opportunities that have been imposed on them. Right. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, here in my area, the grocery stores have not on their shelves for weeks. In fact, I just went this morning before our conversation and there's still no toilet paper. And so kids are picking up on this as well. And I wrote the article for Fee saying, you know, well, when the kids are asking, why isn't there toilet paper? Or, you know, why are we only allowed to take one carton of eggs? Uh, or why is there a milk shortage? These are wonderful opportunities to explain basic economic principles to children uh, and maybe to relearn them ourselves. And I mean, the idea with the toilet paper shortage, of course, is that um, there is a supply chain disruption and there is increased demand for toilet paper, that we all naturally feel like we have to hoard toilet paper because of this uncertainty. Because of that, the value of toilet paper has increased, but the price isn't increasing. So shopkeepers aren't raising prices. And so there's nothing stopping any of us from doing what we feel we naturally must do, which is hoarding toilet paper. If shopkeepers raise their prices, 
Um, you know, this is often criticized as price gouging, but in fact, what it does is actually signal to us as as the buyer, gee, maybe I shouldn't be hoarding that toilet paper. Maybe I should just take as much as I need because now it's more expensive. And more importantly, it signals the supply chains that toilet paper is in really high demand. We need to produce more or we need to bring more toilet paper to market. And when that happens, of course, the price of toilet paper comes down again. Um, so whenever we have rationing or price controls uh, or, or not allow shopkeepers to write to write prices, we have shortages. And until those prices rise, uh, those shortages would continue. So there's opportunity to kind of teach uh, basic uh, value theory, either either, you know, the marginal value of, of a good, uh, the subjective value as opposed to the labor value of producing toilet paper in a way that that people are seeing. And economics is one of those things that's not necessarily in, intuitive to people, so it, it is a it is a great uh, lesson as you um, haul off with that that huge truckload from Costco of ten thousand rolls. <laughs> yeah, so there's so much learning. There's so much learning to happen uh, right now from an economics perspective. Um, at Fee, we've just opened up a new Facebook group called Learning at Home that talks about you know how do we present some of this information to young people uh, and also really take advantage of all these other other wonderful resources as well. But there's just, again, so much learning that, that can happen. One of my favorite stories uh, that I also wrote about for Fee recently that's come out of this pandemic is the story of Isaac Newton, who back in 1665 was a college student who London, which killed a quarter of months. Uh, so just a vicious uh, epidemic there. And like many others, Isaac Newton fled his university, he was 24, and went to his childhood home. And it would be called his year of wonders because he formulated his theory of gravitation. He invented differential and integral calculus. He came up with his theory of optics. He would say himself that it was the sort of peak of intellectual productivity and creativity in his in his entire lifetime and would really form the foundation of his scientific discoveries uh, going forward. And so I think that the message for those of us now, instead of focusing on um, how much has stopped or how much we've lost or how much productivity isn't happening in our economy, instead, let's think about this could be our year of wonders, right? This could be our most creative time. This could be our We do our best work and have our, our most profound ideas. And that's true for adults as well as children. I think um, really looking at this as, a, as what we're gaining instead of what we're losing can make this a much more fulfilling time. You know, you know it, um, she's, it, some people might get upset if I compare to Isaac Newton, but I think the logic is the same. Uh, the, uh, the young singer, Billie Eilish, and every unschooler and homeschooler probably knows this story already, but um, she at 18 took home five Grammys along with her brother, and both of them were unschooled, and, and they would both argue that this is, this is how I was able to find my comparative advantage, this exceptional talent that I have for music or singing, and, and it wouldn't have happened if they had been shipped off to a regular school where, where all of that creativity and, and weirdness and, and beautifulness was just, just sort of beat out of them. And the result is um, incredible talent uh, being being uh, realized. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, uh, Billie Eilish, as you say, is one of the most decorated singers in modern history, you know, really took uh, center stage uh, at the Grammys. And I think that is a testament to the possibility of, of education without schooling and of maximum creativity when that originality isn't crushed through a system of mass compulsory schooling. And the same thing again is true with Isaac Newton. When he left school, he found that because he was free from his professors and free from his assignments, he was able to do this important work. Uh, so and again, instead of thinking about what we're losing and the, the, what we're not connected to uh, over this period of time, let's focus on what we can have access to and what we can gain. So our 
most public schools just very expensive daycare centers? <laughs> I think that's coming to light too, right? That there that there's this sense of, well, my kid has to be in school because I have to work. Um, and that's a reasonable point. I mean, I do think then we do need to have a serious discussion, right? Is this just custodial care in schools versus real education? And if it's the former, then we can do that much cheaper uh, and potentially more successfully than if we're really combining the two. Um, and I think, you know, again, this is where homeschooling can maybe provide some insights is that, um, for example, my husband and I both work. There's a lot of two working parent households who do learn, have their children learn without school by accessing many of these uh, resources in our communities. For example, in-home micro schools or low cost private school, hybrid private schools that work on uh, the homeschooling um, um, under the homeschooling umbrella, where homeschooling becomes a sort of legal lever to enable parents to take back control of their child's education, to have freedom and flexibility in learning that doesn't exist for public schools and in many cases private schools because they're still regulated under compulsory attendance laws at the state level. And when you're able to free uh, yourself from that, your family from that through homeschooling's pedagogical and legal flexibility, it opens up all kinds of um, experimental models for learning, many of which are low cost um, and really maximize community resources and enable parents to both work and children to really learn uh, free from a lot of the co coercion that occurs in typical schooling. So you you mentioned this as well. I think it was in a Cato podcast, but but one of the one of the upsides of of a really catastrophic event uh, like happened with Katrina in New Orleans is that a very broken, very dysfunctional education system was finally open to reform because all of the old uh, political coalitions that protected the broken system um, gave way to the desperation that, that something had to be done, something had to be fixed, and, and, and minds were open to the idea that there might be a better paradigm to do that. Tell that story. Stanford's Terry Moe, an exceptional book called The Politics of Institutional Reform a year ago, where he traced um, the devastation of Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and how it, because of the massive scale of destruction, it also destroyed and control bureaucracy and look to nearly all charter school system in New Orleans, which remains to this day, um, arguing really that that couldn't have happened had it not been for the disaster on the scale of Hurricane Katrina. And so I would suggest that, you know, as terrible as this pandemic is and how disruptive and um, stressful it is for all of us, it could be a moment of um, ushering in some creative destruction in terms of education. It could really prompt a massive education reset uh, in many ways, one of which is, again, putting parents, putting families back in charge and enabling parents to connect on a deeper level with their children than they may have had a chance to when we're always on the go, when we're always so busy with activities. Um, really showing parents that it's not that hard to facilitate your child's learning uh, outside of a classroom because of the abundant resources that are available to families. Um, so I think that there will be, you know, certainly I would be surprised if we don't see more families opting for homeschooling. I would also be surprised if after this, we don't see more uh, demand from parents for education choice mechanisms, in particular education savings accounts, uh, which in many ways are the gold standard of school choice programs because they, again, put parents back in charge of education, allowing them to use some of their uh, school funding for education uh, costs. But unlike vouchers, education savings accounts don't just pay for tuition in another school, education savings accounts um, use uh, this broader definition of education, really allowing parents to uh, pay for tutors or books or classes and courses uh, outside of schooling. So I think we'll see more demand for that. Um, and then, it, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the education establishment itself. I mean, will some of these Will some of this regulatory respite that we're experiencing now and compulsory attendance laws being loosened and federal testing waivers occurring and work being set 
at home being considered optional, you know, is there a chance for some of those regulations to um, be weakened going forward in the same way that we're seeing healthcare regulations loosened uh, for the benefit of workers and, and patients during this time? So um, there's a lot to wonder about and, and really think about uh, as, the, as this unfolds. Uh, some people watching this will will immediately dismiss everything that you and I are saying because um, what we're what we're really arguing is that that teachers are no good. And it strikes me that there is a categorical difference between the system, the machine that we're complaining about, and and the teachers that are trying to do their best to educate children within the constraints of that system. But it strikes me that that sort of uh, creating new options and treating every child as as unique and and an and opportunity to to let that person blossom is also an opportunity for really good teachers to do what they've always wanted to do in a system that actually rewards their abilities. Absolutely, in the same way that children's creativity is stifled through a system of mass compulsory schooling, teacher creativity is often stifled and autonomy and opportunities for um, personal agency and, and innovation are really halted by te for teachers within this system um, of regimentation and standardization. And I often write about, and, and especially in my unschooled book, write about the public school classroom teachers who became so frustrated by what they were seeing, so disenchanted by the bureaucracy, the stifling of creativity at the teacher level, that they left to create these alternatives to school, um, these self-directed learning centers for homeschoolers or these hybrid homeschool models that I mentioned, um, where they could really demonstrate their own creativity and really tap into those reasons that they went into teaching from the beginning which was help potential and cultivate their creativity and curiosity. Uh, and they found that they were able to do that outside of the system. And so I think there's a lot of room for education entrepreneurship. I think that will be, again, another big trend of this pandemic, um, not only because of the increased demand from families for wanting something for their kids, but also for teachers to uh, there are these possibilities for going forward and being creative as, as professionals. So let's. Uh, I think it's. I think it's worth revisiting because I'd like to give uh, struggling parents right now trying to figure out uh, sort of a, a better way to educate their children while the public system is shut down. Uh, tell us again. You, you've mentioned various resources that are available to parents, but but start with your book. Um, tell us the name of your book and where we can get that and, and give us some of these other resources. Sure. So my book is called Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom. Um, you can it in any local bookstore, but uh, perhaps, you know, nowadays I would suggest going on to Amazon and you can either get the Kindle version or the audio book immediately or wait a few days for the paperback. I think uh, books are being delayed a little bit, but they uh, it will come. And yeah, in the book, I really trace the, the history of schooling, the theory of unschooling and self-directed learning, really going back uh, in the book to the Enlightenment era and thinking about John Locke and this theory of self-determination and freedom from coercion and then tracing um, the modern kind of self-directed education movement throughout the 20th century into the modern homeschooling movement, um, really beginning in the late 1970s. Um, and then I trace all of these uh, homeschooling families, and unschooling families and uh, unschooling alumni, unschooling organizations like these self-directed learning centers that I mentioned. So it, I hope, gives a, a good glimpse of what learning without schooling is. There's a lot of research in there about uh, practices and outcomes of unschoolers and, uh, and, and really show, uh, you know, all kinds of different ways of approaching unschooling. I mean, even unschooling itself um, is a broad term and you'll find many families and, and organizations practice. If there's a spectrum in terms of philosophy, even under uh, self-directed education. So I highlight all of that. I think in terms of really what parents can be focused on right now at home with their children, 
taking the pressure off again of replicating school at home. Um, linger over breakfast if you can. Allow your kids, especially your kids, to sleep in. You know, we know, for example, teenagers physiologically, uh, their their clocks are different, and they often, you know, stay up later and sleep in later in the morning. And allow them to do that. Of course, we all should be focused on health and well-being at this time. And then explore together some of these really wonderful um, online resources that, again, are free. I mean, you know, I know my kids are really interested in how viruses work, right? Aren't we all? <laughs> there are these incredible science videos. Um, there are these stories and videos around all the inventions that are coming to the forefront now, particularly, as we mentioned earlier, with healthcare regulations being uh, loosened a bit to help fight the pandemic. So I think we'll see a lot of uh, mounting interest in our kids for science and technology and invention coming out of this. Um, and watching that with your children, I think, can be a real um, bonding moment and, and really open up some new doors and, and new areas of exploration for everybody. Okay, and even the occasional weirdo budding economist, there's room for us too, right? <laughs> Yes. So, uh, well, Fee has some wonderful online, free online learning resources, uh, learning center, and all kinds of articles and materials to take a peek at. I'd also give a plug for Marginal Revolution University, which has online economics 101, introductory economics classes, um, all video based that are exceptional. Uh, awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Carrie. You've given, uh, I think, parents some resources and some hope and and all of us an opportunity to look around the corner of this crisis and, and do something that's better for all of our kids. Thanks, Matt. It's been great to be with you. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.